Hi there, esteemed audience. Welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent, author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. You know who I am. Uh, this is episode number 26. I'm assuming hopefully this isn't your first. Uh, if it is, welcome. Uh, make sure you go back and check out the other 25. Lots of great episodes uh, that we've been uh, fortunate enough to have so far. Uh, usually at the front of the show here, I like to talk about my books, let you know where you can find out more about me. Um, remind you that you can get Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees as an ebook to download for free whenever you're watching or listening to this. But of course, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to remind you of that tonight. Um, if you're curious for more about me, check out middlegradeninja.com. Uh, instead, tonight I've got two separate things I'd like to talk with you about. Uh, the first is uh, just how excited I am about uh, what a success I feel that the show is. Um, I was really hoping that this would become sort of like a um, a uh, writer's conference that anybody could listen to or watch for free, uh, and that you would get the same information you might get in an hour or two hour uh, session that you attended at a conference without having to leave your house or, or your gym or wherever you're listening to this. Um, and so far, I really feel that that, that is the show, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, I always ask our guests to refrain from profanity, which is absurd. If you've read the book of David uh, under my pen name, Robert Kent, you know I love profanity. Um, mm -hmm. Because I am talking with a lot of authors for um, the middle grade audience and the young adult audience, uh, I wanna make the show not targeted to them. Uh, it's targeted toward uh, writers and publishing professionals, people who love books. Um, but I wanna make the show available so they can tune in and listen to their uh, favorite authors. Um, but because we are we are a show primarily aimed at adult authors and adult publishing professionals, um, as the show goes on, I fully expect that we're gonna have uh, some authors who do not write middle grade or young adult. Um, I'm always excited to, to chat with anybody that I think is a, is a talented writer like our guest tonight. Um, but tonight we are going to talk uh, about some more adult subjects. Uh, my guest is Amber Smith. Uh, Amber Smith is the author of Something Like Gravity, uh, The Way I Used to Be, and many other wonderful books. Um, and they contain some more adult subject matter. So this is my warning that if there are um, younger listeners um, uh, tuning in, that they may want to they may want to skip this episode, or they may want to consult with uh, legal guardian uh, as to the appropriateness for them. If you've got children listening to you as you're listening to this, um, you might want to use discretion. Uh, the show's not scripted, so I don't know exactly what we're going to talk about, uh, but I suspect we are going to address some more adult uh, issues that may also trigger some painful memories for uh, listeners. So for that reason. Um, I want to give you two phone numbers right here at the top of the show. Uh, should you or someone you know need them, I want you. To, I want to give you the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's 1-800-273-TALK. Uh, I also want to give you the number for the National Sexual Assault Hotline, uh, and that's 1-800-656-HOPE. Uh, if you need additional resources, you can find a great list at our guest website, ambersmithauthor.com. There's lots of great information out there. Um, so if you're in a position where you have something you need to talk about um, or you need some help, get it. Don't wait. Um, seek out those resources and, and get help. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention, uh, and I know that uh, at this point in the, in, in the show's run, we've got listeners uh, all over the world. Uh, so hello, Australia. Uh, hello, um, Canada. Uh, hello, Belgium. Uh, who else is showing up on the list pretty regularly? The Netherlands. Hello. Um, wonderful to see you. Uh, you may be wondering what the heck is going on here in America. Uh, and to be honest with you, a lot of us Mer Americans are wondering that ourselves. Uh, the other thing that I ask uh, guests not to talk about uh, extensively is politics. And I realize that when I'm chatting with writers, uh, that's a sort of a silly uh, guideline, uh, which is why we abuse it all the time. Uh, because I'm talking with people who um, have strong opinions, who want to share their thoughts with the world. So, of course, politics are a part of those thoughts, as are religion uh, and all, all sort of other subjects that you might not discuss in polite company. Um, so, I don't. I'd never want to be a political pundit. Um, I am trying to take politics out of my life as much as possible. I've removed Pod Save America from my podcast list so I can focus more on the on author podcast. I try not to watch political shows. Uh, I learned that in the over the past couple of years, it is 
better for me just to read the news, understand what's happening, and then step away from it for the things that I, I can't personally impact. But this week, and it feels like um, since uh, the election in 2016 into uh, 2017, it feels like it's just been one major scandal, one major terrible thing after another. Uh, and it's 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 weighed on me. I know it's uh, weighed on a lot of uh, a lot of you listeners. Um, it feels like um, you know they, they, then they show the before and after picture of the presidents. Usually, after eight years, they look much older going out of office than they looked going in. Uh, I think when this particular president leaves office, that's going to be all of us in the country looking much older uh, than when he went in. Um, I watched The Apprentice with my parents uh, when it was on. I liked the show. Uh, it was something we could talk about. I always thought uh, Donald Trump was a bit of a jerk. Um, never thought he'd run for president. And when he did, I thought, well, this isn't a serious campaign. He's probably looking for a book deal or something. When he won, I was shocked, as, as I'm sure many, many of you were as well. Uh, and at the time, it felt like something wasn't quite right. How could that have happened? It didn't make sense. And there are plenty of, of racists and, uh, uh, and fanatics here in, uh, in America. And there are plenty of people who had other reasons that wanted to vote conservative. There's, there's two choices uh, realistically to vote for, uh, and neither one of them probably encapsulates all of any one group's desires. So I don't care who you voted for uh, at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I was done with the guy after after Charlottesville when he when he got in office. I said, well, he's our president. So let's hope he does a good job. But then he endorsed Nazis. And I said, nope, we're, we're done with you. I wanted him to impeach them. Uh, since then, the Mueller report has come out. Um, it is very clear uh, that there was, at the very least, the appearance of collusion between his campaign and Russia, uh, at the very least, the appearance of it. Uh, and very clear that he did obstruct justice. This man is a criminal. Uh, he committed campaign violence violations to get into office in the first place. And this week, just when I, I feel like I've become numb, because again, it's Charlottesville, I'm all upset, but then nothing happens. So you, you got to insulate yourself, protect yourself. Uh, then the Helsinki conference happens and we're up in arms and oh my God, and then nothing happens. So insulate ourselves. This week, that man indicated that he would commit collusion again in the upcoming election. It will not be a fair election. This cannot stand. If you are in America, you need to get angry. And I don't care which side of the political spectrum you're on. The president cannot be above the law. I don't know what's taking the Democrats so long to begin impeachment uh, hearings. They need to hear from us. They need to know we see them, that we will not accept this cowardice in waiting for another election. You need to call your senators. I did this myself today. I um, I was playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, so it was nice. It was relaxed. I had my smartphone out. I just Google Indiana senators, Google the the office of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Uh, I called each of them. I left them about a two minute message uh, expressing my concerns and asking them to act on an impeachment. I tried to remain calm, level headed, did not use profanity. I don't know who listens to those messages. Um, I'm assuming it's probably some staffer. I don't know necessarily that the content matters, just the volume. They need those messages. They need those emails. It took me 10 minutes while playing a video game to call each of them and leave those messages. So if you're in America, if you care about our democracy, this is the most danger it has ever been in. If this is allowed to stand, we will be under an authoritarian regime. There are immigrant children, it was revealed this week, being moved into internment camps. People are dying. This is not a time to sit back. And you know I hate to talk politics, especially here on the show. I hate to divide the audience. I want to talk about books and reading. But we cannot stand back. Um, too many men and women have died protecting the freedoms that we enjoyed. We cannot let them go quietly. We must make those phone calls. Anyone you can find to resist, now is the time. Do not wait. And that is it. I'm off, I'm off my soapbox. Uh, so back to Middle Grade Ninja and the regularly scheduled program. Uh, make sure you join us on Tuesday, the 16th. Where we're going to be chatting with uh, Marie Miranda Cruz, enjoying her new book, Everlasting Nora. That's going to be a wonderful episode. Uh, coming up after that on the 25th, we'll be chatting with editor Diana Foe. That's going to be another wonderful episode. And tonight we are in for a treat because, as I said, we are chatting with author Amber Smith. Amber, how are you tonight? 
Hi, Robert. I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Ooh, calm it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's pivot and let's talk books. So I am uh, terrible at summarizing other people's books and other people's biographies. So probably the best way for us to get started is if you would tell a esteemed audience uh, a little bit about you and your background in publishing thus far. Okay. Um, so I'm Amber Smith and I am here talking about my third novel for young adults um, called Something Like Gravity. And this story follows um, two teenagers, one of whom has recently come out as transgender and is in the middle of dealing with a lot of very heavy stuff from his past. And the other character is um, grieving the loss of her older sister. And so the story is about a lot of things, but at the center of it is this love story between these two characters, Chris and Maya. And so it's all about falling in love for the first time and finding yourself in the process. And I want to talk at length about something like Gravity because I really, really enjoyed that novel. Um, it, it spoke to me. I've got a, um, a very dear friend uh, in my life who, and I uh, knew her daughter as a sullen, unhappy, uh, depressed teenager. Uh, and I've now known her son after the transition as a very happy young man. I can uh, I I can see a bit of myself in him, uh, and he's never been happier. Uh, and this story spoke to me because that's not just something that happens out there. That happens right here in Indiana. Um, and I really uh, I identified with Chris's journey, and I think the readers will as well, because it's it deals with a lot of universal themes. This question of of, of finding yourself, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and and that's part of um, why I wanted to focus on the love story because love really is such a universal experience. It's something that that everybody. Um, can relate to regardless of you know what your world looks like everybody understands love so let me uh let's just dive right into the book uh mm -hmm. who is the ideal reader for this story oh everyone um so <laughs> I, I think you just pick up a copy <laughs> yeah <laughs> everyone should read this book um i'm kind of joking but kind of not um so I, whenever I write a book, I'm always thinking of my teenage self and, you know, what are the kinds of books I really needed when I was um, growing up? And that sort of guides me in the books that I write. So on one level, I'm writing it for teenagers, but on another level, I'm writing for the adults who still have these um, teenagers who need to be healed inside of them too. Um, so I think a lot of my readers, um, for all of my books actually have been both, um, young adults and adults. And, um, we'll step back uh, briefly. Who are uh, some of the authors and some of the books that inspired you when you were younger and made, mm -hmm. made you want to be an author? And were there any books that directly inspired something like Gravity? Ooh, um, let's see. So some of the most important books for me um, were Speak by Laurie House Anderson. So that book came out when I was a senior in high school. And um, I was the first person in my school to read that book. Um, I got it from my uh, my school librarian, gave it to me to read before she had even cataloged it into the computer system. And oh, I think I was going to say, we, we had it on a waiting list here. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. So she just... I remember she was actually unboxing the new books and she handed it to me and she said, why don't you give that a read over the weekend and just let me know what you think. And of course, when I look back on it, I think she really must have known I needed that book. Um, and that book really did make a huge impact on me. And that was one of the first books I read where I felt like, wow, you know, I am not alone. Um, I am not the only one who has ever gone through this and has felt um, that, you know, there was no one else who could understand. 
And so that's sort of the approach that I'm coming from when I'm writing now. Um, but one of the books that I also read when I was a teenager that definitely influenced something like Gravity was Annie on My Mind by Nancy Garden. Um, I can't remember the exact date that book came out, but it was in the 80s. So it was a, it was a very early book. Um, and it was a love story um, about these two girls who, um, you know, fell in love with each other and all of the the things and the challenges they had to go through with their friends and school and their families. And um, that book was so important to me when I was a young person because, um, you know, as a queer person myself, Back in the 90s, you know, there really wasn't a lot or really any books that were featuring gay people as in, in a positive way anyway. Or if there were gay people in a story, it really focused on only the challenges and the tragedies. Um, and often it was, you, we, I kept reading these coming out stories, but I felt like, well, okay, but well, what happens in your life after you come out? And um, and Annie on My Mind was one of the first books that I ever read that really tackled that, where the characters felt like whole real people that had complex lives. And um, uh, I don't know, that book really made an impact on me. And so when I thought about making something like Gravity a Love Story, I went back and I read that book and it just brought back all of those feelings for me again. Was there anything uh, from that book that you tried to, um, you know, obviously not not copy, uh, but uh, to inspire you in the way that you uh, wrote something like Rabbit? Um, I'm not sure if it was um, anything really specific more than just, um, wanting to present a, a relationship that was complicated and messy and beautiful and all of those things that first love um, tends to encapsulate. So first love is never perfect, but it's very meaningful. Um, and, and that's something that I took away from Annie on my mind. And then, um how much research did you do in preparing something like Gravity? I know in the afterwards you mentioned, or I'm sorry, in the author's note, you mentioned that you went to the uh, LGBTQ Center at Wake Forest. So what kind of resources mm -hmm. were available to you there and, and where else did you go to research uh, your characters and your story? Well, um, most of my research really was more like um, anecdotal research. So just talking to people, talking to friends and, um, friends of friends and just trying to, to gather as much, um, as much experience as I could kind of talking to people about what their lives have been like. So I talked to some transgender people, um, people who identify as non-binary and, um, oh, and as you mentioned, I had, um, a professor from Wake Forest University who is also the um, the found the founder or the director of the LGBTQ center there, and um, they read the book for me and provided feedback and notes that were really really helpful. So one of the things I wanted to be very conscious of because while I am queer, I'm not transgender, and I really. Um, wanted to make sure I was doing a good job of in my representation and not doing anything that would seem harmful or exploitative in any way. That makes sense. And, and how, how do you walk that line? What, what tips do you have for authors that would like to write about this subject? Uh, and what, and certainly, you know, 
they, they want to make sure that there's drama, there's there's romance, there's all the things you come to expect when you come to a story. Because at the end of the day, you, you do want some entertainment value um, mm -hmm. for your readers. Yeah. It's, it's not nonfiction. Um, so how do you walk that line between making sure that you're providing that story, suiting your thematic purposes without exploiting the characters? Hmm. Um, for me, I think while the, the situations and the circumstances of my character's life, like Chris, for example, um, who's the character who's transgender in something like Gravity, um, so our lives are different in a lot of ways, but the what I really try to do is make the emotional worlds very much based on my own. And so I think when I allow my own, um, my own experiences and my own emotions and thoughts into these characters in different ways, um, that helps me to really stay connected to them as if they're a real person. And um, I mean, I don't know, that's just sort of been my approach to trying to draw characters who are um, real and, um, you know, not one dimensional is because there's so much of me in them and I really begin to think of them as real people. And so, um, yeah. Well, I don't, uh, I don't imagine that that process changes uh, that much uh, depending on the book. Um, you've always got to do some research and you're, you're always going to find that yeah. part of the character that's at least a little bit like yourself so that you can understand them and their, their inner workings. Yeah. Yeah. Even my villains, I just find the most evil part of me. And like, all right, if I if I took down all my uh, restraints and just let myself run amok, how evil could I be if I went that direction? And that's the <laughs> character. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I mean, I think every character, even the, you know, the ones that nobody is going to like and they're not supposed to like, even those come from, from me or you know, some part of my life. <laughs> and. Um... I'm also chuckling because, um, of course, you have to do research. I, I just uh, had published right. the book Banneker Bones and the Alligator People, and I don't, I can't tell you how much research I've done on alligators. And if an alligator person were a thing, what would that be like? What I want to make sure that I'm, I'm respectful of the alligator people and any other uh, any other topic that uh, that I ever create. So I think most authors, so long as you you have that. Um, yeah, uh, that sense of wanting to respect your subject matter, whatever you're writing about, you're you're probably going to be all right. Uh, yeah. you, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. I think you hear yes, my sorry. dog working. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a, a cat running around here at my feet, so <laughs> we're going to be all right. Um, oh, I had a question for you, and, and now I'm thinking about the cat, and I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> I, oh, I wanted to ask you if you had employed sensitivity readers, or who did you who did you take the book to, other than your your editor and your agent? Well, I had the um, I had a couple of friends, good friends who I really trusted with the material, and who, um, you know, had given me a lot of feedback through the drafting process. Um, so I had some friends, and then I had um, the professor at at Wake Forest, who um, you know works in in their LGBTQ center every day, and deals with you know queer youth um, on a daily basis, and so they were really steeped in a lot of this culture that I'm I'm a little bit removed from since. You know, I'm a writer and I work from home and, you know, I'm not, I actually don't interact with um, teenagers all that often. So it was really important for me to get a perspective on this book that, um, that was different from mine. Okay. But yeah, I think it's really important, especially um, especially when you're writing characters that are outside of your own experience, I think it's really important to um, have readers who can just kind of um, watch out for any 
anything that you might not think of that that could be problematic because the last thing that you would want to do is write something that could be harmful yeah that um and i'm, I'm assuming the intention is, is always pure uh it's just making mm -hmm. little mistakes not knowing uh what you need to know to to, to not be wrong right right so you mentioned, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the book, but I, but I have to ask, you mentioned you, you, you're you at home a lot of your time uh, mm -hmm. working. Um, do you write full time at this point in your career? I do, yes. Oh, good for you. You're living the dream. <laughs> Some days, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, what is your typical uh, schedule like? Do you maintain a, an everyday right from the same period of time to the same period of time? Or does it have to vary depending on, on what you've got going on? You know, it's it's really strange. I feel like it's been very different for every book that I've that I've written. Um, so sorry, there's my dog again. <laughs> um, so for example, like with my first book, I was still doing my day job at that point and um, so I would just find an hour here or there, and it took me a really long time to write that first book because I just sort of took any moments I could get. And then with my second book, um, I was writing full time at that point, and I had a really strict schedule for myself that I kept every day um, through the writing process of that book. And with my third book, with something like Gravity, it was just all over the place. I don't know. Um, I had no structure. <laughs> in my life whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, but obviously it got written and, and it's brilliant. So whatever, whatever you did worked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, late nights fueled by coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, people, people don't know this, uh, who are, who are uh, still aspiring uh, to be an author and, and go full time, or uh, who just love books and, and don't write themselves. But I'm sure you have many, many activities aside from solely writing, marketing responsibilities, and, and everything else. How much of that time is uh, of your of your week is that eating up? You know, when I when I left my uh, my regular full time job to start writing. Um, I just had this totally different idea of what my days were going to look like. I thought, oh, I'll have all this time. To, I can just like write book after book, spend every day writing. I'll get so much done. And um, it is not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, you know, um, I think one of the things I kind of didn't realize before I got into publishing was how important it is to have a presence online through social media and um, just there's a lot of self-promotion and marketing that you have to do that, you know, I think I, you know, being really naive and not knowing anything about publishing before getting into it, um, I guess I just had assumed, oh, like if you get your book published, your publisher just does everything and and it really doesn't work that way it, it has to be more of a cooperative relationship so um yeah that so really that does take up a lot more time than probably most people would imagine wouldn't it be wonderful if there were magical publishing elves that that came in and, and worked in the workshop while you slept and you came out and you found that there were there were shoes everywhere whatever the the classic table is. Yes. <laughs> done that for you. you just leave finished manuscripts all over yeah that would be awesome <laughs> One of my uh, favorite anecdotes is uh, Stephen King has, has famously said that he, uh, when he was uh, drinking and abusing drugs uh, and also writing amazing literature, uh, which, which I always like to remind people of because I said, well, it must be the, the alcohol or the drugs. And no, we got plenty of junkies. We got plenty of alcoholics. They didn't all write Stephen King's books. There, there was something <laughs> else going on there. Um, but he uh, says that he does not remember writing Cujo. Uh, he just he had it and he was like, oh, this, I got this book and he turned it in. And like. That's that's magic elves, dude. <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, yeah. I've heard that story um, from Stephen King um, about you know how he doesn't even remember that book, <laughs> and it's funny, you know. 
Uh, not that I would ever condone like substance. Um, no, of course. Important PSA. We are in no way condoning yeah, uh, like, substance abuse. Right, yeah. right. Amazing stuff like Stevie King. Just do it sober. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think you know. Sometimes we do see great writers who are doing amazing things. You know, and I think of you know some of those old like those great American novelists who were like seriously messed up. <laughs> Um, but they were creating amazing work. And sometimes I wonder if it was, you know, I think every person who's trying to be creative in some way has to figure out like a workaround in the brain to like sidestep all of that self-criticism and all that other junk and be able to like set it aside for a minute or not a minute, but for significant amounts of time in order to just like get the work done. And at least long enough to, to finish the first draft. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't know, probably for a lot of um, for a lot of writers or creative people, like substance misuse is kind of like a really easy shortcut to like doing that mental work. <laughs> but, it, yeah. it does. Uh, on the other hand, so I, um, sooner I or later, there's that. a significant decline. <laughs> I yeah, was I uh, amused. I'll check. Oh, sorry. Um, I do a lot of meditation actually before I start writing to sort of like just clear the mind and help myself focus so I can, so I'm not thinking about like, oh, I have to do laundry and the dishes and walk the dogs and like clean the kitty litter pans and, you know, all of that stuff that's always in the back of your mind. Like, so I find that if I meditate before I write, even just for a few minutes, it really helps me just kind of get in that zone. Makes sense. I'd like to, when possible, I like to take a, a nice long walk. Although these days I live with a five-year-old. So the, the idea of what the ideal um, set of writing, it, it just never happens. It's, it's strictly, okay, he's sleeping now. I've got an hour. Let's do this. Or I've got, I've got a couple hours. If I get up early, whenever I can do it, let's get to it. Now I just find that if I can, when I'm drafting, I just write as fast as I can and just get it out. And I, I don't worry that it's not good because I know I'm never going to publish anything uh, that I haven't revised at least 25 to 30 times anyway. So that first draft, just get it on the paper and give me something that I can work with. Uh, and I find that, that writing fast helps me you gotta write faster than your, um, uh, than your doubt and, and, and your fears. Yes. But talking about uh, substance abuse, this, this is something that just absolutely cracked me up here locally uh, as, a, as an author who, whose name I won't say. Um, and it, uh, uh, he, he told me about a uh, neighbor of his that really wanted to get into writing. Uh, and so was coming over and talking about writing on a regular basis and then started day drinking because he was reading a lot of Hemingway. And he's like, this man's amazing. What, 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 what wonderful writing. I want to write like that. So he starts day drinking. Uh, and my friend finally says, you know how the Ernest Hemingway story ends, right? And the guy had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> he, he had read the biography of Hemingway to know that the man drank, but didn't read the sad, bitter ending of, of Hemingway's life. Like, buddy, read the whole thing before you start. <laughs> before you oh, start no. drinking in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, nothing's funnier than alcoholism. Anyway, okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> um, what did I want to know? Oh, I wanted to ask you for some specifics. What uh, what kind of stuff are you doing to market uh, yourself, market your book, since the, the happy publishing elves aren't coming to do it for you? And what have you found most effective? Huh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, you know, some of the things I do, um, I try to, you know, keep up with being active just on, on Twitter and um, Instagram. Instagram is the one social media outlet I actually enjoy doing. Um, so that's fun. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I think really interacting with other authors is a great way to kind of get yourself out there and supporting other authors is, is something I try to do as well. You know, if I see, um, you know, a tweet from an author, I'll retweet it and that just is, is, you know, one more connection that you make with people. Um, and I think it's those connections that are really important. Um, 
So some of the other things I've done um, is partnering with bloggers to do like a blog tour or the bookstagram people who do those amazing, elaborate, like gorgeous posts of books and everything because they have such huge followings. Um, and I don't know how they do it because it's just, it seems like it's got to be a ton of work. But, um, you know, I think just trying to find those people who, who, kind, who kind of like get what I'm trying to do and want to help, help get the word out, I think. I can't say how effective, you know, each thing is, but, um, or I can't say that, maybe not necessarily that I can't say how effective I can't say that there's necessarily a, ratio, a you know a ratio between oh I did this effort and then it resulted in X amount of sales. So I still know how to like quantify it in that way. But <laughs> when you find the magic uh, formula, you come back, you tell us. We, we want to know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, you will be the first to know. <laughs> That's what that what's that old adage that uh, only fifty percent of marketing works. Unfortunately, nobody knows which fifty percent it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to, to ask you, um, and we're going to come back to, to something like gravity. I, I promise we're going to we're going to do a, a, a deep discussion on it. But I also want to talk a little bit about your your career and and, and what's brought you uh, to mm -hmm. the lofty heights of, of the Middle Grade Ninja podcast. Um, how long did it take you to work on your first book, The Way I Used to Be, and how long did it take you to get that one published? Oh, well, so like I was saying earlier, I was still working my full-time day job when I was writing that book. Um, so it took me a long time to write it, probably about, um, probably about three years. And then, of course, by the time I finished, and I thought, okay, this is really a book. And so what next? How do I get it published? So I was like one of those people who actually Googled, how do you get a book published? Because <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so at that point, I found out that regular people don't really get to talk to the publishers <laughs> and that you need an agent. So um, I started researching. Um, agents who represented books that were similar to mine and i just started querying them um, about my book and i got a ton of rejections so many rejections like two years worth of rejections <laughs> um but you know in all of those rejections i did get a lot of good feedback and there was interest so it wasn't just like an endless stream of no responses. Um, and I think that kind of helped me to keep the hope alive a little bit. Um, so ultimately I did find my agent, um, but yeah, I think it, it really did take about two years to, to find her. Um, but I guess it's all about um, finding that right person who, who, you know, understands what you're trying to do and so. and how did that go did you you, you said just a, a query or had you met them at a conference no i just um i just did queries so basically it like it got pulled out of the um slush pile <laughs> um so yeah i don't think i don't know that's uh the, a very effective way to go about it because here's what happened along the way. So I was researching the agents who represented books that were similar to mine because I figured they would be interested in what I was working on. And the catch was they were interested, but a lot of them felt like I was too similar to other clients they had. So, um, yeah, I think I, I went about it the total uh, long way. <laughs> so now that I'm more familiar with publishing and, and meeting so many authors who all have different stories about how they found their agents, um, there's a, there are so many ways to do it. Like you said, sometimes you can meet an agent at a conference or um, 
you know, there are different ways to connect. Sometimes they'll do, uh, they'll ask for like Twitter pitches. And if they pick your pitch, then you can send them, you know, pages, that sort of thing. So it's really interesting to see how many different ways um, there are to, to connect with an agent now. But so I would say most important thing is to do research about, you know, because I did research about, you know, the traditional kind of way of, of doing things, but there are so many other ways that probably would have cut a few years off of the journey. <laughs> yeah, well, if you, you know, I always say that there's a, as many different ways to, to publish and write a book as there are authors. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, just because something works for for one doesn't doesn't mean it will work for for anybody else. Um, but I do love hearing that that journey because uh, obviously you you get your agent your agent is who Jess Regal, uh, so you, yeah. you get hooked up with uh, with her. Uh, and then how long are you out on submission from there? Did you have to wait a long time and go through multiple publishing houses, or were you quickly uh, sold? Um, it it wasn't really that quick. Um. So I'm sorry to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think one of the things that happened along the way, um, we did sort of a first round of submissions and there was an editor that was interested and they gave me notes to submit a revision. It was a really extensive revision though. So with my first book, I, how it, it is in its final version, it's divided up into four parts. Um, so it's freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year of high school. So it's chronological in that way. But it was originally written with alternating scenes going from like the past to the present, past to present. And one of those um, notes that I got from the editor who who didn't end up being my editor was that they really thought the book would be stronger if it was rewritten in chronological order. And um, so I had to do a Well, I didn't have to, but as I thought about it, I really, I liked that idea and I thought it made a lot of sense. So I went through this major um, overhaul of the manuscript and I basically had, had to literally rewrite the book. Um, so that took me, a, you know, probably the better part of a year. Um, so. But at that point, you were okay. sure that, that when you did it, it would for sure be published, which, which had to be a different experience. Yeah. No, um, no. So it wasn't for sure that it would be published. So um, and then it wasn't so that so that editor, it ended up not working out, actually. And we had to resubmit to a whole round of editors again. So, um, but I got fast responses the second time around. And I think one of the things that was going on is that, um, so the way I used to be, it deals with sexual assault. And I think what we were seeing happening in those years that it was just so slow um, and, you know, like we couldn't get that spark of interest um, I think we were starting to see a lot of those really high profile um, sexual assault cases in the media. And, you know, suddenly it's really, uh, this is a topic that's on the forefront of people's minds. And so I think we got an offer just a couple days into that second round of submissions. Actually, it was multiple offers. So I think it was, again, just that really good timing. So it took a long time, but ultimately I think it all happened at the right time because um, people were actually paying attention to the topic that my book was about out in the world at that time. So how did you uh, keep uh, keep your sanity during all of that? Because you, you don't know the future. You didn't know that this was going to have a happy ending. Yeah. Um, how, how did you stay focused and, and get the work done and, and perfected without losing your mind or did you? Yeah, I I think I probably did lose my mind a little bit <laughs> in there, at least a few. You're only human. <laughs> yeah. But um, 
Well, I've worked on other things while I was waiting because um, sometimes it's really long periods of waiting and waiting and not really knowing what's going to happen. So um, I try to keep busy working on other things. And um, so, and I just tried as best as I could to not dwell on it. Um, and another thing is that absolutely nobody in my life, family, friends, anyone, knew that I was writing a book and trying to get it published. So that kind of helped because I didn't, I wasn't getting all those questions from people like, oh, so what, so what's going on? Is it going to be published? Is it not? What's happening? Um, <laughs> all those questions I'm, are killer. <laughs> yes, because I did get those questions with my, when I was writing my second book and it, it, drove me crazy because I already was putting so much pressure on myself. And even though people just ask questions because they're interested um, and it makes a lot of sense because, you know, it's, this is um, a career that is, a, is, you know, kind of different. And, um, but anyway, yeah, it's hard because I think often I'm so critical of myself and I'm always thinking I'm not, getting enough done. And so when I get a seemingly innocent question, like, oh, so how much, how many words did you write today? And like, you know, my head explodes. Because <laughs> sometimes it's negative words. <laughs> Which that counts. I too. deleted more words today than I wrote. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. that is absolutely a good thing. Like, oh, esteemed reader, you're going to be so happy you didn't read those terrible words. Tomorrow oh, yeah. I'll put the better ones in there for you. <laughs> and so yeah. let, us, uh, let us live vicariously through you for a moment because of course uh the way i used to be comes out it, it, it's uh, uh it comes out in 2016 it's a new york times bestseller um mm -hmm. pretty pretty early on in the run it's uh wins multiple awards puts you on the map uh and, and, and ensures that you're if not a household name on your way toward it what is that experience like after working so hard and, and so long um, to get there. Oh, you know, um, when my editor called me to let me know that my book had made the New York Times bestseller list, I saw the the New York area code number pop up. And my first thought was that they changed their minds and they did not want to buy my second book after all. <laughs> so I listen to how shell shocked we poor writers get. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was completely shocked. And actually there was part of me that legitimately believed that first week that it was a mistake. And I was going to be getting a call like, oh no, actually we made a mistake. It, it's not a bestseller. <laughs> but, um, we said yeah, bestseller, I, we meant worst seller. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where, that's more where my mind went. Yeah. <laughs> was there ever a moment in there where you just said, oh, the dream happened. Look at me, author. Uh, or are you still working toward that? Yeah, I still don't know if I'm there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody talks about imposter syndrome, and it is so true. I mean, I I have it too. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, especially when I'm trying to first start out writing a new book, it's like my first drafts are not even complete sentences. I mean, they're a mess. And I have to, it's like I have to relearn how to write a book every time. But it, it does, some things do get easier. But uh, yeah, I have moments where I severely doubt myself. Well, I always feel that like if you get to a point where you're not severely doubting yourself, you probably should be. <laughs> you, you might be a little bit overconfident and, and, and cruising for a, a fall. <laughs> 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 and then um, one, one more question just about uh, your approach to writing. Well, probably lots more. I'm, I'm, I'm like a lot of you. Probably lots more questions about your approach to writing. Um, but one question uh, is you mentioned you didn't tell anybody you were writing a book. Is yeah. that still kind of your modus operandi? Do you share your stories while you're working on them with anybody or do you keep it all close to your chest until it's time to go? Actually, I do. I do share my ideas as I'm working on them. Um, I, I share them with 
close friends and um, people who I who I know can understand where I'm at least trying to come from and can kind of help me think through some things and give me some new perspectives to think about. So yeah, these days I really do share my ideas with people because um, I find that it really helps um, to kind of get out of my own head. And do you use uh, critique partners or do you have folks uh, that, you, that you, yeah, that you swap critiques with? Um, you know, I really want to. Um, I've been a critique partner for some other authors and it's always been my intention to be able to swap manuscripts. So I read theirs and they read mine. And every for every book, um, well, my second and my third book anyway, I've been on such tight deadlines. I haven't, um, I have, and I'm, a, I'm not a fast writer. So I'm usually always late for my deadlines, at least by at least a week. So I always mean to have a critique partner, um, another author look at it for me, but there's never, I've actually never had time for that. <laughs> What, uh, how, what's your usual uh, speed? Do you try, do you aim for a daily word count? Do you aim for your amount of time spent in front of the computer? How do you mark your progress? Um, you know, when I was working on my second book, I did strive for um, a word count every day. So I tried to make it, um, it was like, if I could do 7,000 words a week, um, and sort of however that got divided up. And that's sort of how I marked my progress. Um, and with my, with something like gravity, it was a little bit different. As I said earlier, I was just kind of all over the place with when I was working on that. So some nights I was working on it all night long, other days, you know, I'd only have maybe an hour to put into it. Um, so, I would just write until I had a scene drafted. So I didn't necessarily worry about word count or pages. It was just, did I capture this entire scene um, in this writing session? And that's what really helped me move along um, and feel like I was making progress. Wow. That See, to me, that would be almost more intimidating uh, to get the entire scene. Like, oh, well, that's going to be at least three or four chapters. <laughs> was a wonderful pivot back to something like gravity because I've got more questions for you about this book and I, I want to make sure we, we talk about it as much as we possibly can. Uh, so obviously my next question is Amber Smith, have you ever seen a flying saucer? Do you believe in them? Ooh, good question. Um, have I seen one? I'm not really sure. Do I believe in them? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Okay. I think there's a little bit of a, a maybe a bit of a story there. How, how are you not sure? How, how close to, to, to not sure are you? Well, you know, um, when I was a kid, um, so my dad was in the military and we lived really close to the army base. And so there were always, you know, different aircraft flying around close by. And I think when I was little, I just, I thought everything was a UFO. Because <laughs> um, some things would look really strange actually, but so I still don't really know. Well, I just assume since something like gravity ends with an alien invasion, spoilers. That <laughs> <laughs> No, we won't. We won't talk about the ending. Uh, but you can rule that one possible ending out. That that one doesn't happen. <laughs> that would be see. quite a plot twist. So with uh, with something like gravity, did you? Um, well, let's talk first about writing a romance because I'm I'm always wanting to know what tips do you have for esteemed mm -hmm. audience uh, for for all the people out there who want to write a romance uh, other than read something like gravity see how it's done right, and then do everything that Amber Smith did, but add the alien invasion at the end, then, then, then you're on fire. Um, what, what tips do you have for writing a romance? What's the secret? Um, 
Well, you know, it's funny. When I started writing this book, I wasn't actually thinking of it as a romance. Um, so Chris and so the book is told in the alternating points of view of Chris and Maya. And originally I had conceived of these two characters as the protagonists of their own separate books. Um, so Chris was dealing with coming out as transgender, processing some you know traumatic stuff that he had gone through, trying to figure out how to navigate the changing relationships with his friends and his family and you know pretty much everything in his life. And Maya was dealing with this terrible loss of her her older sister who she had a really complicated relationship with and it was making her really question her own identity so those two stories when they're separate are really really heavy <laughs> were they going to were they ever going to touch over or have similar points like a shared universe or was it just going to be strictly separate originally no, they were they were completely separate. And I think um, I was working on them at the same time. And at a certain point, they because I like to sort of hop around when I'm writing. If I get stuck on one thing, I try not to sit there and dwell on it. I'll go and move and to work on something else until I can get unstuck on the other thing. But with these two, That's an excellent I was stuck tip. On Does that get you over uh, writer's block any, any time that, that might come up? Yeah. yeah, it really does. It really does. Except for with these two. So it ended up that I was, I just hit a wall with both of them. And, um, you know, this was, as we were talking earlier a little bit about the um, political climate, um, I was doing this when there was a lot of really, uh, really uh, things going on that were making things seem very scary and uncertain. And I just found that I wasn't really able to work on these two stories as I had envisioned them because there's a whole lot of other stuff going on in the real world that was way heavier um than my fictional worlds so um so i decided at a certain point i wanted to give chris a love interest as a way to kind of bring in some light into the story and some 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 little spark into his world and so as i started thinking you know okay well like what kind of person would be good for chris and I immediate my first thought was, oh my gosh, it's Maya from the other book. And then my next thought was, wait, and Maya would be perfect for Chris. <laughs> so um, I don't know. It's funny that I was working on them at the same time, started them at the same time. And it took me so long to realize they were actually meant to be part of the same story. And so... I started um, working on what would become something like gravity and it really moved naturally away from focusing on the struggles of Chris coming out and the struggles of Maya grieving to really focus on this, um, this relationship and this love story. When something like that happens, it, it always feels, to me at least, uh, uh, when something lines up that like I didn't see originally and I should have because it was right there the whole time and then, and then it comes together beautifully, uh, it feels almost like magic. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Is this your subconscious working quietly while your, your front brain is working on the, the, the mm. day in, day out of writing? Or is there a muse somewhere in your, your writing office just whispering to you? <laughs> Um, I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I often will, um, you know, I really, I think the subconscious is really, really powerful. And often it's when I'm kind of like you were talking earlier about really loving to go on walks and like I meditate. I like going on walks too, to, to clear my mind. And I always find it's when I'm not actively thinking about something that the ideas start coming to me. 
So I often will wake up, you know, in the middle of the night from a dream and I'll write down a thought that I have, um, things like that. I mean, I think there is something to that. I don't quite know what it is, but yeah, it's, it's really great when you find these little moments of serendipity that, um, just, it makes it feel like it was truly meant to be. Yeah, it does. It, uh, to me, that, that, that's part of the juice. That's part of what keeps me going with writing mm -hmm. is those magic moments along the way that, oh, I'm still kind of the same dumb guy I was before I started the novel, but the novel's not dumb. Somewhere in there, something great happened, either within me, through me, somehow it got on the page, and look at this. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yes. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not a question, just a, a shared excitement uh, for, for your discovery. Um, but uh, a couple of questions I did have. Wait, at what point did you decide that um, alternating points of view were, was going to be the best way to tell this story? And, and also, uh, with that, what does that allow you to do that telling the story from just one of the characters' perspectives wouldn't allow you to do? So, two-parter. Ooh, okay, that's a good one. Um, so, this is the first time I've ever written anything in a in a multiple perspective, um, and I I really I don't know. I felt like this was going to be a really complicated um relationship and we wouldn't be able to get the full picture from just one person's side of things um so i don't know i just from the beginning i i knew it was going to be both of their voices and maybe that's because their each voice was so well formed in my mind before i started um weaving their stories together into one book. Um, but yeah, I think what was really nice with this book, writing from the two points of view, I feel like anyway, or I hope <laughs> that we could get a lot more empathy when we're seeing kind of the big picture from each point of view. Um, you know, because if we see things from only one perspective, it might be very skewed and you can often think the other party is, you know, not, uh, I don't know. It's, it's easy to kind of put people into boxes, whether it's in real life or characters, when you don't have that level of um, compassion or um, understanding about what, someone's really going through. And with characters who are going through things as, um, as deep and complex as Chris and Maya are going through, I really wanted to have that, um, that close narrative voice with them. And I love that, that we're, we're getting two um, somewhat heavy stories uh, uh, to start us off. I mean, there's 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 quite a bit of humor uh, mm -hmm. between Chris and, and his dad uh, and the aunt. Uh, I, I loved all of that stuff. Um, but there's, you know, we're teasing out this this terrible thing that we know has happened to Chris uh, and sort of the isolation that he's feeling. Uh, my uh, sister, Mallory, has has died. Um, you know, and, and we're dealing with, with, with all that heaviness within there. And then, um, small spoiler, but it's not a spoiler if it happens in the first 50 to 75 pages. This is a long book. Um, but then we get this wonderful meet cute where Chris almost runs Maya over with the car. And it's like, oh, that's where we were headed. Okay. Romance. Good times. <laughs> that's, it's not going to be all dark. And um, let me ask you about... Uh, about uh, Mallory, because um, I, I, was, I was so curious, because there's, you know, the sister has to die. There's any number of wonderful ways to kill people. I prefer zombies myself. Uh, th th those aren't available. M many, many illnesses and other things. And you chose a, a sudden death, just just suddenly dead uh, there, there at school. 
how did you come to that choice? Uh, and why was that the best way to take Mallory out of the story from the myriad of other options uh, that you choose? Or was it something that just always was and you discovered it as you were writing? And that, that just was what happened, so you had to go with it. You know, um, I wasn't sure in the beginning um, how Mallory had died. Um, but when it was, when I was originally writing it, uh, Maya's story, it very much revolved around this relationship between the sisters. And so I had to really pull back on, on Mallory and the, um, the details of what happened. And um, I thought of this sudden death um, where she, yeah, it's not a spoiler because I think we find out in the first few pages, um, her sister had recently died from this very obscure um, heart, heart um, condition that nobody knew about. Um, and there were no warning signs. So I, I decided to write that part of the story because when I was young, uh, probably maybe 12 or 13, there was a family friend. So they were not my friend. They were only a couple years older than me. So they were a kid too. And they, they died in this way. And even though I wasn't super close with this person, their, their death always kind of haunted me in a way, like the, the silence of it, um, that someone could just be here one moment and then gone the next. And um, I don't know. I mean, that always really made an impact on me. And to this day, I mean, this is now what, like 25 years later. And, you know, I still think about this girl and her family and just thinking like, how do you, how do you move on from that? And so that's, that's really where Mallory came from, and um, and a big part of Maya's story is about me, you know, trying to answer that question: How do you move on when things, when a life can just end suddenly for for no apparent reason? And of course, the existential question of uh, if that could happen, if, if, if that can, what are any of us doing? If that could suddenly just take us out of play like that? Yes. Why am I saving for retirement? <laughs> 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 Let me ask you uh, also about uh, another technique um, that you you employ in the story is we know that something very bad has happened to Chris. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily know that it's a, I don't think we know that it's a full out assault. I did because I, I, I read the description of the book before I read the book. Um, but mm -hmm. I don't remember if it's it's explicitly stated. We get kind of these flashes. We, we get him on his, uh, on his bike uh, going to the place where it's going to happen. We get the introduction of the characters uh, for, for quite a bit. And that's put off. So what does putting off the details of that uh, allow you to accomplish as opposed to putting it just as a as a note at the start of the story hey this happened now we're moving forward to what's happening now yeah good question um so i think with chris's assault that happens um you know before the book begins um there were kind of two parts to that that i i felt really strongly about um so the first one was, if this is going to be a love story, I didn't want to just put all of the details on the front end of, of what happened because um, it's really traumatic. And the other part of the reason why I, I sort of wanted the details to kind of filter through slowly throughout the book is that Chris is also on this journey of fully kind of understanding the, the severity of what actually happened. So he, I, I think part of it is through, it happened naturally through writing his voice that 
you know, he didn't want to think about how how bad it was or how bad it could have been. He just wanted to kind of move on. But as we go through the story, it it keeps coming back until, you know, we as readers and Chris as a character also um, has to kind of see the big picture of everything that happened. Oh, that's a wonderful answer. That absolutely makes sense because that does clearly demonstrate uh, Chris's his mindset and, and his thinking about about the event. That that made this is why I like to talk to writers who are smarter than I am. Look how much I learn uh, having these conversations. Like, yes, that is what a smart writer does. Thank you, Amber Smith. <laughs> um, so another question I, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, about something like that. Well, look. Let's talk a little bit about um, the thematic concern because there is a lot of oh, what's the word? There's a lot of uh, astronomy talk. There's a lot of um, talk. Uh, Chris has a, a telescope and spends a lot of time looking at the sky and thinking about uh, how long it takes light to reach Earth uh, and, and how some of the stars that are coming to us are already dead uh, and they've died so long ago that we don't know it because the light's just now reaching us. Uh, and that's kind of a theme throughout the book. Um, so with, with, without giving too much away, or, um, why was that a good, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not theme, but motif, uh, a good motif for this story. And how did you come to decide on that? Uh, well, um, so I really wanted a way to incorporate in this book kind of some of my own nerdy interests. So I'm a total astronomy geek myself. and. Um, the other thing is, I don't know, whenever, so I'm not a very science-minded person, but I'm very interested in science. So I tend to take what I learn about science, um, science-based fields, and sort of, in my mind, they're very artistic and symbolic. And so I wanted to kind of use Chris's um, interest in astronomy as a way to kind of talk about the way he relates uh, to the world. And um, I don't know, I mean, I think one of the things I find really profound about astronomy and sort of thinking about the universe is that we are all, we're all, you know, everything that's out there came from the same thing. But so we're all connected in this really, um, almost like incomprehensible way, yet we can all still feel so isolated as well. So, I mean, um, I think that was the big thought that I had about um, what I wanted to do with all the astronomy stuff. Um, I don't even know if I ended up going that deep in the book with the meaning, but in my mind, that sort of, um, where like the point of view that Chris is coming from, like how can we all be so connected and still I feel so alone? Now, of course, listeners to this show know that the part of your interest in astronomy has to be trying to find another one of those flying saucers you, you maybe thought you saw when you were younger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one more question uh, about something like uh, gravity. I, I wanted to ask about the parents because I, I love the parent characters uh, in this book. Um, so I wanted to ask one about, uh, it's, it's the same question, but it's another two-parter. Um, Chris's uh, father is, is very uh, accepting uh, of his transition, um, almost, uh, almost overly so, really going out of his way to uh, to do the best he can, which is you know preferable to the alternative, uh, whereas his mom is, is is not is not at all comfortable with it, and we can see that that has impacted their relationship. There's also kind of the the odd thing where the dad and uh, the aunt uh, used to date a little bit in high school, but then uh, he, he moved on and married the the sister. 
Um, so that's going on. At the same time, Maya's parents have this interesting story where they're divorced, but they're still living together uh, year, years later. And, and so they're miserable and, and, and her father's hiding out uh, in, the, in the basement with this tiny TV until the, the, her mother leaves the house. So they've got a, a, a bad relationship. And Chris is, is Chris's parents, uh, while not quite as extremely uh, as, as extreme a bad relationship, it's definitely very strained. Um, what does that bring to their romance? Uh, and, and how does that play out for them, you think? Well, um, I really wanted the parents to be, um, to feel real and to feel human. And so, especially because this is a story about a relationship, I wanted to show how, um, how complicated relationships can be. And so we see different dynamics going on with each set of parents that really inform both Chris and Maya about um, the kind of relationships that they want to have as well. And um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this. Um, well, I think, you know, the older I get, I, I tend to really look back on my life and I have a lot more compassion for myself when I was younger and trying to figure things out. And, um, but I also have a lot more compassion for the adults who are in my life. So my parents and relatives and teachers and, you know, because now that I'm, I'm an adult, I understand just how much is going on that, you know, probably, you know, your children don't know about. And um, I don't know, I wanted to really illustrate that moment where a young person kind of gets that their parents are also human and flawed. And um, even though they are flawed and, and messy and, you know, maybe they've messed things up and they don't know how to do the right thing or say the right thing. Um, that there's still hope that there's a way to, to get around whatever. And so, well, I was going to keep going, but I think I might give away a spoiler. So I'm, I'm going to do it. You know, that's the, the moment in the book where the aliens show up. It's, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me, uh, let me, I know we're coming uh, close to the end of our time together. So let me ask you two more questions and, and we'll call it a night. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you said um, that one of the things that you're writing for that you're, you're hoping will do, you want to foster, um, I want to get this exact, you want to, you want to foster change and spark dialogue. Do you feel that's a mission that you not have fully accomplished, but are in the process of accomplishing? And how have you seen that play out? Hmm. Well, um, no, I don't think I've fully accomplished it, but I hope that with each book, it, um, I'm in some way helping to kind of bring, bring a new perspective to certain topics. Like the things that I'm really passionate about, I, I end up writing about. So I'm really, um, passionate about you know, being an advocate for LGBTQ equality and um, ending gendered violence. So these are these are kind of my two big things that I'm, or two of my things that I really care about. And so I always try to, I, I sort of think of characters and then I figure out how I can incorporate these characters that are kind of, floating around in my head with the the topics that I really care about. And so I hope by kind of giving giving the issues and the topics that I I'm, am really passionate about a human story behind them, what I hope anyway is that those stories can reach people and help to just um, 
gain a greater sense of compassion for, on the one hand, people who are going through things that you haven't experienced, but then on the other hand, for people who have experienced some of the similar things that my books um, are about, whether it's sexual violence or domestic abuse, as in my first two books, or um, in something like Gravity with coming out and, uh, and grieving. For those people who do relate to those things, what I hope is that they read these stories and they feel like they're not alone and that their experiences are validated and they're seen and understood by someone out there, even if they are fictional characters. Because behind every fictional character are so many real people. And Amber Smith is very real. <laughs> um, one more question for you. Okay. Um, if there was one thing that you could go back and, and, and tell an earlier version of yourself when you were starting writing, one piece of advice that really would have made a difference that uh, any writers who are listening to this um, maybe could take to heart and, and, and improve their craft, what would that piece of advice you'd give uh, past you be? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> it makes me a little bit emotional, actually. Because um, when you were when you were just saying that, I was thinking back um, to when I was in high school. The only class I ever took in my life um, were writing was a creative writing class I had in high school. And I remember I was really interested in the arts, like the visual arts. That's what I went to school for later on in college. And But I loved writing. I've always written. I've always kept journals and written poetry. And I remember I remember I was really excited to take this creative writing class. Um, and my teeth now I had I had some amazing teachers in my life, but this particular teacher was awful. Um, I wrote <laughs> I wrote yeah, they were terrible. They were terrible to me. They so leave a I big impression, writing Yes. Well, um, I remember writing a story that was, you know, probably only very thinly veiled as fiction, but, you know, it was probably pretty obvious that I was writing about my life and some really hard stuff that was going on. And um, I remember getting getting my story back and there were just all of these horrible comments on it that were personal comments. Um, From the teacher? Saying things, yeah, it was very strange. And I've talked to other writers who've had similar experiences. Um, so my teacher, and I was like 16 or something, and they wrote on my story that, um, that I personally was self-indulgent and self-absorbed, things like that, because I was writing about um, personal stuff. And I think particularly a lot of women are told that their stories don't matter. And I thought that. I thought that I was not a good writer and I didn't attempt writing for another decade. I mean, um, so I think, I think that happens a lot where especially young women are not encouraged or they're told that the things that are important to them don't matter. So I would tell my younger self that your voice matters, your experiences are valuable and are worthy of being shared because I did not believe that for a very long time. No, well, I'm gonna get a little bit emotional. That is great, excellent advice uh, to, to give to young writers and a, and a wonderful note to end on. Uh, Amber, where uh, can esteemed audience uh, find you online and track you, track down information about you and your books? Um, you can find me on my website. It's ambersmithauthor.com. I am on Twitter as a Smith author. Instagram, where I'm most active, is ambersmithauthor. And the same with Facebook, ambersmithauthor. So I love uh, readers. So please connect with me there. 
Yes, uh, I am following on Twitter, and everybody listening should should do the same um, because it's just nothing but but additional great advice on on how to be a better author um, and, and how to be more Amber Smith like. So you don't want to miss uh, you don't want to miss what's going on there. Uh, you can always follow me, esteemed audience, at middlegradeninja.com. Log on, read interviews with. Uh, hundreds of authors, all of my favorite authors, um, hundreds of uh, literary agents, publishing professionals, editors, all kinds of great folks, the kind of folks that come on the show. You can read those interviews at middlegradeninja.com. Uh, don't forget to find your way back here on Tuesday of next week when we'll be talking with Marie Miranda Cruz. That's going to be a wonderful episode. Um, Make sure you download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. If you like it, leave a review. Next time you're at your library, ask that they make sure they have a copy on their shelves. If not, request it, get it stocked on there. Uh, and for the love of God, call your senators. Uh, write your senators. Find a protest march. We could be looking at the grimmest time that has ever happened within any of our lifetimes. We are losing our country as we speak. Make the Democrats take action. Impeachment must happen. What a happy note to end on. Uh, Amber, thank you so much uh, for being here and, and, and for making the time. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation and, and, and one of my favorites that I know I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to several times myself uh, to Grokin's fullness. Um, I've been asking our guests to say a sign-off phrase for us. It's the very ninja-like hi -ya, mm -hmm. and what have you. Will you sign us off? <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm terrible at thinking of like of cool things on the spot. So okay, I'm gonna sign off by saying, "Ditto." Please, everyone, call your senators. Call your senators. <laughs> We're 100 percent agreement on this point. It's never been more important. Okay, you get it. Call the senators. Hi, Al. What have you? Thanks for another wonderful episode, esteemed audience. We'll see you next week. <laughs>